Well, tonight we're going to see what is called the most watched movie of all time. And it's a film that definitely pushes the boundaries of the portrayal of higher truth in film. It goes beyond even Frankenstein and Dracula, which portrayed the lower truth of the fall of the ego. But in this film, we are seeing the path to enlightenment and liberation. The path to non-duality. And non-duality in Christian terms is equivalent to salvation. And the film, of course, is The Wizard of Oz. How many have seen The Wizard of Oz? Pretty much everyone, okay. <clears throat> but you haven't seen it like you're going to see it tonight. <laughs> now, so today I took notes, too, too many, and if, if it, this gets boring, I want you to start booing <laughs> or throw apples, and I will uh, leave the stage and let you see the film. But you might find it useful, and the reason is that the author, a man named Lyman Frank Baum, uh, who was born in 1856 and was a very extraordinary being uh, in, in the U.S. at that time. He actually lived in Kansas when he was writing this in 1890. Uh, he, he, he was a druidic theosophist. He, he was actually a member of the Theosophical Society led by Madame Blavatsky. And... Uh, and he comes from Scots uh, Irish ancestry, was very tuned in to the Druids, and of course the Tuatha the Danann as the worshipers of the goddess, uh, this worship and this understanding of the nature of the goddess was embedded in the film, as well as the uh, the understanding of the Advaita path, which was also embedded in theosophical and druidic thought. And so uh, we, have, we have a man who's very informed about higher consciousness, who is writing this story for children, uh, ostensibly, but frankly, I don't think so, even though I think children will enjoy it. And there have been many different uh, levels of interpretation of this film. As I noticed when I went online today, many of them are stuck on the political level and want to interpret this as a communist uh, or labor-oriented uh, tract and uh, want to, uh, to deal with it in some cases as a feminist uh, tract. But uh, although, it, and it's true, he was, where, he was married to a woman named Maud, uh, what was her last name? Maud Gawn, I think. Yeah, Maud Gage. Maud Gawn was, was married to, um, to the Irish poet uh, Yeats. Uh, Maud Gage, who was the daughter of a famous suffragist. And, uh, and so that kind of political activity was going on in his life. And he was also uh, not only politically active, but active in theater and, and traveled around the U.S. Uh, as a performer and director and then a writer. And he ended up writing uh, 14 Oz novels. So this was just the first, and the story was continued. But the first one contains, I think, the entirety of the message. And the film uh, is different than the original book that he wrote and includes some of the elements of his uh, later uh, writings and comments on Oz in it. I think the film was made in 1939. <clears throat> so the film opens on a, a barren country road, very desolate scene, and we see Dorothy running along the road with Toto beside her. And she's obviously frightened. 
She's in a scared state. And so right away we have the framing of the film's uh, message. Dorothy represents consciousness on the run. Okay, this is very important. What is she running away from? It turns out she's running away from the judgment of a woman who claims that, uh, that her dog, Toto, bit her and, uh, and will need to be destroyed, okay? So there's a judgment that is pending against Dorothy and Toto, right? So this is a very important point because we have to understand the film as a dream. And therefore, in a dream, all characters representing aspects of the self, this means that Dorothy is plagued by a self-judgment that is disturbing her peace. Okay, it's not a judgment of another, even though the woman, Miss Gulch, who turns out later to be the evil witch, uh, is, is seemingly external, but that witch is an internal superego figure that is attacking her, right? Okay. Why? What is the judgment about in this case? It, the judgment is against her loyalty to her dog, Toto. Because she is allowing Toto to trespass on her property, chase her cat, uh, come into her garden and make a mess, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so what she's being judged for is her loyalty to Toto. Now this is very interesting because Toto is the central character of the film. <laughs> Not Dorothy. Why? The word Dorothy, by the way, means Doron Theos. It comes from the Greek, which means a gift of God. Okay? But Toto is God. Literally, Toto, total, right? Toto in Spanish, but total, totality, the whole, the absolute. Toto represents, signifies the absolute which is a very interesting thing since, you know, Toto, uh, Toto is not perfect. <laughs> I mean, I don't think I'm biased when I say he's a rather scraggly and, uh, and small and uh, not a very handsome animal. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> But what he is, is a Cairn Terrier, okay? This is very interesting, a Cairn Terrier. The word Cairn comes from Scotland, and it's a word for a memorial megalith. Terrier, the word for Terrier, it comes from Terra, the earth. So where he is representing the ground of being, and yet, it is a memorial megalith to something in the past or something other than what is being signified. So Toto is representing the fact that the absolute, however it appears in the physical plane, cannot appear in, with perfection. There is no perfection in the relative plane. Even though Toto is perfect, in the absolute plane. But Toto, as we will see in the, uh, as the film unfolds, he is unchanging, whether they're in Kansas or they're in another realm that isn't Kansas anymore. Uh, Toto is the same. The other characters change. So uh, Toto represents uh, <laughs> Dorothy's loyalty to the absolute. And the, the important thing I think about terriers is they are fearless. And, uh, and of course this terrier is very well trained and he is the intuitive uh, guide who never fails 
to know the right way to go, the right thing to do, the right way out of the trap, and he guides Dorothy all through her journey of being tested at a soul level during this film as she develops uh, and, and pursues her self-realization. So Toto guides her, but Toto is already there. He doesn't need to grow, he doesn't need to change, he doesn't need to do anything. He's literally along for the ride because she has given her love to Toto. Toto can never be captured by anyone, witch or evil beings of any kind. He will always escape. He can only be captured by love. And so he's captured by Dorothy's love. Her love is divine love. Okay. So, in the beginning, when we see Dorothy running home, scared, she's totally full of herself and her problem, which is this uh, judgment. And uh, she approaches her parental figures, who are not actually her parents. They are her Aunt Em and her Uncle Henry. I hope I'm not ruining the film for everyone, but you've all seen it, so I don't think it even matters. But what does that represent? It means that these are parent figures, but Dorothy has already reached a level of emotional maturity where she has cut the umbilical cord with the mother, and the father is not the one she is dependent upon to get the name of the father from. She has that installed, and although she has a sentimental attachment to Aunt M, she is not stuck. She is not in one of those mother-child dyads that can't be broken in the unconscious. That's the source of most pathology in the ego. So she's already in a state of relative freedom. But she's full of herself and her problem, which is this self-judgment about herself for being too different, for wanting something that nobody else seems to care about, know about, or having, have any interest in finding out about. She is alone. She is dealing with aloneness. She's dealing with the, uh, the, the uh, trial of individuation that is causing her to have a different frame of reference than everyone else in her life. No one can understand her, as Professor Marvel will guess later on in the film. And so she comes and interrupts uh, the two parent figures whose incubator has broken uh, and their chickens are, are in danger of dying and they're counting their chicks and trying to save them. She is too busy with her problem, but very soon she will be the one who saves all the celestial chicks who will be the munchkins when she ends up in this other land, okay? So although she can't function on this plane to be of much use in the practical world of work, she is very useful, even though accidentally, in killing witches and negative uh, problems in the, the realm of uh, Empyreans. So uh, Dorothy reveals to them that uh, she's in trouble. Uh, Miss Gulch is, is, uh, has tried to hurt Toto, but, but failed. Toto can't be hurt, even though people will try. And, uh, but they don't think anything of it. They do not take her seriously. She's a child. She is not recognized for who she is and what she knows and how far she has developed spiritually. She then meets the three workers in, in the field and the one who will be the cowardly lion is bullying the one who will be the scarecrow. And Dorothy interacts with this future scarecrow and the, the scarecrow guy criticizes her 
for not having brains because she's taking Toto through Miss Gulch's garden. Why doesn't she walk home another way? And, uh, and he accuses her of, uh, of, not, uh, of not having uh, and using her brains. And then he says at the end of this little interaction, her head ain't made of straw, you know. Well, of course, it's his head that will later be made of straw. But this signifier, head of straw, unites them. He projects the signifier on her, and it is his own signifier. And this unification of a shared signifier is a, uh, let's say, a, a, an exchange of a, uh, a token of the currency of love because there's a deep understanding between them. And that is because they are both wacko. <laughs> and head of straw, in this case, this, this signifier means a kind of crazy wisdom. That means we know about something others don't know about, which is real too. So, she has a different kind of wacko strategy because he is kind of an idiot on the, uh, the, the phenomenal plane, hits, hitting his finger with his own hammer, et cetera, do, doing things that are obviously uh, a negative sort of clowning. But her wacko strategy is that she wants to learn how to be a wizard. She wants to become a ma magician. She wants to know about the divine powers that transcend the ego. So then she has the scene of, uh, of falling into the pigsty. The future lion man saves her and tells her to have courage. Of course, he is the one who really lacks the courage. And then the future tin man shows up and says they'll build a statue to him and he will soon be a statue because he can't move. He's going to be rusted. And so everyone presents themselves in real one in the same way that they will be in real two, but with an entirely different meaning, an entirely different depth of implication when they finally get to Oz. So the Auntie M says, go away, sit somewhere where you won't get into trouble, and then she, Dorothy goes into a reverie state and said, hmm, I wonder if I could ever find a place where there is no trouble, all right? Where is a place where there is no trouble? Well, it could only be a world governed by divine love in which everything is beautiful and perfect and there are no negative projections, no judgments, no uh, conflicts between people. She wants a world of magic and a world of love. And then, of course, she goes into her main song, Somewhere Over the Rainbow, in which she invokes this magical realm of real two. And, uh, and of course, in half of the song, she's singing to Toto, and Toto, of course, is already there, and he's, <laughs> you know, saying, okay, let's do it, babe, I'm ready, you know? And, uh, and so the... Uh, the, the song is, is a kind of invocation of what is now about to become real. And so the message of the, of the film is, dare to dream the highest possible dream, because whatever you dream will become your reality. You can make it your reality. Your mind is that powerful. Trust it. And therefore, don't let your mind project negativity because that will become the world you live in. Hello? <laughs> Everyone really wants to live over the rainbow. So why live in Tartarus when for the same price you can be in Oz? Okay. So this... Uh, this, this reverie, this song, of course, is interrupted immediately. Uh-uh, it's not that easy. The witch shows up, 
and uh, she has come now with an actual legal complaint that she was bitten by Toto, she wants him destroyed, she's going to take him away and, uh, and take custody and, and have him killed by, by legal execution. So, of course, Dorothy turns to the parents and says, what are you going to do about this? You can't let her take Toto. And they say, well, but it's the law. We can't go against the law. And, and they prove that they are weak. So in that moment, Dorothy realizes all adults are either evil or weak. And so at that point, she gives up on the phenomenal realm of real one. And she says, no way am I going to live in this world. And she, of course, decides to leave home. Toto escapes from the witch, and, uh, and the two of them uh, leave again. Now they're on the road, but this time they're, they're running away, not so much from the judgment, but from the disappointment in the, uh, the incapacity of, uh, of the, the law to support truth and goodness and right. And Auntie M at some point turn, it turns to the witch and tries to argue with her, but says, as a Christian woman, I can't say what I want to say to you. I can't say the truth. So what we see here is now the impotence of Christianity itself, that religion no longer gives power to anyone to transcend the jurisdictional law of the phenomenal plane with the spiritual law. And that was the whole point of Christ's teaching and his willingness to be crucified. He did break the law, but he broke the law for a higher purpose. And if you're not willing to break the law because there's a higher law, then you're lost in this world. So, uh, Dorothy and Toto are on the road, and almost immediately, Dorothy receives magic help. Because she has taken the risk, she's risking everything in separating from the family system psychologically and the world of the social system as well, she finds uh, Professor Marvel. But her one problem is she is still emotionally attached to Aunt M. And so when the professor tests her, he puts on his, uh, his, uh, his fortune teller's hat, and he tells her that he is from the lineage of Isis, the Egyptian goddess, right? We have goddess worship again. He is someone who is in this line of magic that comes from uh, the, the Druidic and Egyptian uh, sources in the ancient world, and he is the one who will show up later, of course, as the wizard. And when he tests her by saying, oh, he sees Auntie M suffering, maybe she's dying because of uh, sadness at the loss of Dorothy, Dorothy weakens and she goes back. So in other words, she wasn't ready to make a complete cut. So here we have two weaknesses in Dorothy. One is the emotional attachment that keeps her in a weak child state rather than claiming true, true and full adulthood. And then there is this second uh, sense of guilt that is the, the witch's judgment. Uh, in this uh, interaction with Professor Marvel, Marvel and Toto hit it off very well. Marvel shares his hot dog with Toto, mm -hmm. and he says it's, it's among dogs, so, you know, we all share things together. So uh, what this means is that they are resonant with one another. Professor Marvel, even though he's going to turn out to seemingly be a fake wizard, he is acting in the service of the absolute, okay? So... Uh, it's important that we see that because later on that will be the key to understanding what Dorothy really learned from the wizard. But she learns here in this scene because of her attachment to Aunt Em 
that she cannot escape physically from the family system. She must learn to escape it psychologically and spiritually. If she tries to leave prematurely on a physical level, she will internalize it and remain trapped uh, in a sense of dependency. So it's important that, um, that, the, that Professor Marvel uh, did create a friendship with her and uh, a connection uh, to the goddess. And remember, uh, Madame Blavatsky's magnum opus is a book called Isis Unveiled. And the, the whole uh, teaching of theosophy uh, is uh, really uh, aimed at bringing out the truth about the nature of the goddess, whom Dorothy is a fledgling uh, avatar of without knowing it. So. Dorothy goes back, and of course she immediately falls into a stormy depression. She yearns for the greater reality, but she, she didn't have the strength to go for it, and so now she suffers from emotional vertigo. And this shows up as a tornado. And this, uh, this tornado, as it approaches the house, uh, causes everyone else to go into the basement, and she is locked out. So uh, she, uh, she is forced then to continue her separation from the family system. And the tornado then signifies the event of the transcendence of the ego. It is the awakening of the upper death drive. So the soul is now able to use the tornado to spiral upward into uh, real two. But she has to deal with her fear, her helplessness, and her aloneness. And she has to come to accept her situation that, that uh, no one can go with her from the old world into where she needs to discover her real self. At this moment, she is hit by an imploding window. It's very important that she's knocked out by a window. It is the window literally into another world. And then she looks through the window and her life passes before her eyes, just like someone who has died or has a near-death experience. And she sees all the people in her life and she sees the witch and, and she sees uh, the, whole, the whole story that has led to this moment. And so her ego, in a way, has passed out. It's not dead, but she is, she is in a near-death understanding and realization of what ego death is. It is the soul's knowledge of the ego and the significance of its egoic life in the larger frame of reference of the soul and the, the supreme self. And she realizes her life was all a dream, but she's horrified by it, and she must now destroy her inner witch superego before it tears apart her soul. So her house goes up, and then it lands. The landing means she now has her mission clear to her. And in the landing, she doesn't know where she's landed, but suddenly there is silence. The noise of the film stops, and that means she's in inner silence. And now she is present. She's awake. She's aware. And when she opens the door of the house for the first time, she's in a world that's in full living color. Before that, the world was not even black and white, sepia, tinged. It was a very boring, drab, brown color. There was no, no color, or energy, or, or life in her existence. Now she sees the life with a heightened consciousness. And it's a magical world, and, and clearly she, uh, she has uh, discovered a realm that, that is completely new and unprecedented and would be unbelievable except for the fact that she's there. It's real. It is real, too. It's not a dream in the sense of a hallucination. It's more real than real one. 
and she will learn that her house has accidentally or somehow landed on the bad witch of the east and has killed her. So she discovers she has landed in Munchkin land, which is the land of the child ego. This enables her to see that everyone in her life is really a child and not a real adult. There aren't any real adults in her world, uh, but these children uh, are innocent. Uh, and, and in their innocence, they are able to express the beauty of an immature consciousness that has not yet uh, been filled with uh, self-judgment, guilt, and shame, etc. And so she returns to her own innocent child state prior to self-judgment. And she is the hero. Thus begins the hero's journey. She's literally the, the national hero of Munchkin land. And uh, we're, we are not in Kansas, Tarika anymore. Uh, we are not in real one. We are in this land that's the equivalent of the hobbits in the Tolkien uh, trilogy. Uh, but we are in a land where she will not be able to stay because she has committed the crime of killing the witch. Even though it's not a crime to the munchkins, it's liberation, it's a crime to another witch, her sister, who will show up soon. But before that, the good witch of the north, Glinda, shows up. She comes in a purple orb, like an alien spaceship, and uh, she lands and uh, she uh, describes the, uh, the reality of, of what magic power is, and she, of course, represents the goddess the archetypal self, and she's afraid of nothing. Uh, Dorothy denies being a witch. That's the first question that Glinda asks her. Are you a good witch or a bad witch? And she says, I don't know, I'm not a witch. Of course, she is a witch, but she doesn't know it yet. And she is told that, indeed, she has come from a star, and her whole old life narrative, including the killing of this witch, that was her judgment about herself that has in fact been killed because look, what she was believing in turns out to be real. She, there, the world is magic. And, uh, and so therefore she is uh, able to take on the power and the ruby slippers of uh, the dead witch. Munchkin land is celebrating the end of evil the end of the rule of Kali, right? The witch is Kali, so it means the end of Kali Yuga. But as we see, it was a premature celebration because the witch has a sister who is not yet uh, done with uh, putting her through tests and, uh, and creating uh, uh, great anxiety for her. So the, uh, Glinda tells Dorothy she has to get out of Oz. She just got there, but she's got to get out. Why? Because she's in danger of the witch that wants to kill her. And uh, Glinda cannot fully protect her. She's on her own, even though there will be uh, some protection. But she is not allowed to trust that. She has to begin to depend entirely on her own internal resources. But how do you get out of Oz? without going back into real one and the ego. You've got to keep going up. So now she finds the spiral again. It's the upper death drive, but now at the soul level of its functioning, and that's the yellow brick road. And so now she's on the road to liberation, which has to pass through Emerald City, where she will meet the wizard who will give her the information she needs to get to real three. So, of course, the path of gold clearly means that uh, it, there's a reference to the golden age and to the golden light and to the gold uh, of the avataric uh, consciousness. But if she's going to uh, get what she needs and not be uh, waylaid on this path, <clears throat> she's going to have to pass a number of important tests and she will need allies. So although it's a single road, she comes to a crossroad where again, she cannot make a decision which is the right way to go. 
which means that her, her mental powers are not sufficient. Her mind is not strong enough. She needs to have jnana. She needs to have an intuitive understanding of what is the accurate uh, move in every given situation. And so she meets the scarecrow, who is her animus, her first animus figure, who represents mind. Of course, it's mind in the absence thereof. He can't think. He's got a head of straw. But that also represents the fact that the highest level of thought is no thought. It's instantaneous knowing without thinking. But it has to go through a symbolic mastery of thought. So if you cannot think, you also cannot transcend thought. So now she uh, recognizes that through the scarecrow she must get an awakened booty that can discern the truth and function as a jnani. But the... Uh, the scarecrow has no backbone. In fact, he has no bones. He can't stand up. He has no strength. This means that mind power alone is not enough. You can have all the intelligence in the world at the symbolic level and it will not get you to liberation. But it's a good start. And so then they go on, having passed this test, and they come to an apple tree with a toucan in it, something that you rarely see, <laughs> even in Costa Rica. <clears throat> and these, uh, it turns out these apple trees uh, are, are, are not very friendly, and they start insulting her and, uh, and, and, uh, and the scarecrow and uh, are, are very nasty. But in their nastiness, they throw apples at her. They won't give them to her, but they will throw them at her as weapons. She and the scarecrow gladly pick them up and eat them and are nourished by them. Okay? Very important passing of a test. When people insult you, use that. Don't be hurt by it. Be nourished by it. There is more good information in an insult than in a compliment. Okay? So this is the, the first important wisdom that she gains, and as a result of passing that test, she finds herself at the feet of the Tin Man, uh, who is stuck. Uh, uh, he is uh, rusted into immobility, and of course, uh, he's the one who wants a heart. But to want a heart means to want to understand the hearts of others. That's really the meaning of having a heart. It's empathy. It's compassion. It's the ability to get what is really going on that will never be spoken in words or put into symbolic form that can only be known between the lines without words. The wisdom of the heart has a kind of knowledge that's much deeper than anything that can be formulated in language. And so by saving the Tin Man, she is able to then uh, have this ability to uh, awaken her feeling function. Then later, of course, she meets the cowardly lion and puts him in his place, and the desire for courage, for fearlessness, uh, then is added to her motivation for getting to uh, meeting the wizard. Next comes the test of the field of poppies. And the witch puts this field in front of them that they will have to pass through to get uh, to uh, Emerald City. And of course, poppies do, I think, represent opium. And they represent all psychedelic substances. And what, they, what is being said here is, this will give you only an imaginary form of ego death and liberation. Don't fall for it. If you fall for what you get out of ayahuasca or out of uh, opium or cocaine or heroin or uh, LSD or 5-MeO-DMT uh, or whatever it is that, that is the, the thing that made you feel like you had uh, a, a window on uh, the infinite and the real, 
uh, don't believe it. It's an inflation of the imaginary function of consciousness and it will let you down. And you'll find that no matter how many uh, of these trips you take, you're still in your ego when all is said and done. So what happens is the uh, Glinda drops snow on them. I would say snow represents real one death. And what is being given here is a warning. If you fall for the opium, you're going to, uh, to end up overdosing or having some total misunderstanding of reality. Your ego will act out in a way that will cause you to do some very bad karma, misunderstanding yourself, having an inflated idea that you are God and, and that, that can lead to uh, a total failure of, the, uh, of, of, of reaching liberation on the path. And so it is that warning of the coldness of the snow that, uh, that awakens them and then they can pass through onto uh, Emerald City. So you have to attain uh, ego death without any props and it can't be something temporary or situational. It has to be permanent and it has to be uh, uh, complete without any trace of ego remaining. So they end up in Emerald City, and Emerald City, of course, is the Emerald Isle. It's Ireland, and everyone's in green, and they're all uh, uh, leprechauns or other magical druidic kinds of beings, and, uh, and they are, uh, th they are in, in the magic land of a particular sort, which is this, this land of the... Uh, of the worship of the goddess. The, the, the one who plays the wizard also plays many other roles. He is a shapeshifter. Shapeshifting is one of the things that the wizard does in order to be able to awaken Dorothy. Before they go in, all the way into Emerald City, however, the witch makes another appearance and she writes in the sky the words, Surrender Dorothy. Now this is very important, a message. Indeed, if Dorothy will surrender to the wizard as being a representative of God and follow what is uh, commanded to complete the tests, she will uh, reach liberation. But if she surrenders to fear, to the witch, then of course she will lose. So there is the test. To what are you surrendered? Okay, so uh, as they are uh, eventually invited in to meet the wizard, uh, the, they are all overcome by insecurity and when they finally get into the presence of the wizard, he asks them twice, who are you? Okay, the famous question, who am I? Well, they can't really answer the question. And her answer is, I'm Dorothy the small and meek. So here she falls back into her ego. She falls back into a false modesty, a humility that is not up to the task of receiving power. And so, therefore, although the humility is, is good etiquette, it nonetheless uh, is not sufficient uh, to gain her the reward that she's seeking. And therefore, they have to pass through a test to prove their worthiness, which is to acquire the broomstick of the wicked witch, which will mean they have to kill her to get it, no doubt. On the way to, uh, to the Wicked Witch in the evil forest, they encounter paranormal forces that they call spooks. So it is a fact that on this path, at some point, sooner or later, you will have to deal with the paranormal, all right? And you mustn't be afraid of it. But it will show up, and it will show up in ways that will, uh, can be frightening if you do not have the knowledge and the faith in the perfection of reality and of the, the truth of non-duality. 
They are attacked by an army of evil flying monkeys. These are kind of the inverse of the army of Hanuman's monkeys in the Ramayana. And, uh, and Dorothy is captured and taken to the evil witch. They don't care about the others, but they want Dorothy, or the witch wants Dorothy. And Toto, of course. So uh, the witch tries to negotiate by saying, we'll save Toto for you if you give us the slippers. But it turns out she can't take off the slippers even though she agrees to do the trade. They have their own uh, electromagnetic defense shield. The, the slippers have a power that she does not yet have. So we could say it's a dissociated part of her soul that has not yet been integrated into her consciousness, but it's already functioning. Anyway, her three helpers uh, rise to the occasion. They overpower enemy troops. They impersonate the enemy to get inside the castle. I think this is another important teaching that you must use your own understanding of evil, the evil that's in you, in order to understand how to outwit external evil and evil that appears uh, in the dream field. Uh, and therefore, you turn bad karma into good karma. Uh, eventually, uh, uh, in the struggle with the witch, uh, who will try to set the scarecrow on fire again, uh, Dorothy takes a bucket of water to save him and accidentally hits the witch, and it turns out, voila, water is all it took to cause her to melt away. But I would say this is holy water. It has been made holy because it is used in order to save life in, in Dorothy's uh, holy love for uh, these, uh, these parts of the, the self and her fearlessness. And so the witch is actually baptized and included in this energy field of goodness and she can no longer hold on to her beautiful evil nature. So they go back, they have the broomstick, they've done the deed and the wizard breaks his promise. Now, this is very important. The wizard has to break his promise to them. Uh, and, and of course, he's doing this in the service of revealing to them that they should not depend on his recognition. They need to realize they have the power within themselves and they don't need an external wizard to give it to them. And so this wizard is kind enough to give them that teaching Dorothy, uh, the, the, of course, Toto uh, unveils the truth, pulls across the veil that shows that he's just like them. He's a human. He's not this big wizard in the sky. And, uh, and uh, Dorothy then accuses him of being a bad man, but she's wrong. And he says to her, I'm not a bad man. I'm just a bad wizard. I'm a good man. And indeed he is. And his way of being a good wizard is to be a bad wizard. This is a very important teaching. The wizard at some point has to fail you in a way that will cause you to claim your own power. Because otherwise you'll be dependent on the wizard for the rest of your life, and the wizard doesn't really want that. He wants you to become a wizard. But for you to become a wizard, you have to understand you are already the same as the wizard. So the wizard does give them uh, what they came for, which is the recognition of the big other, uh, which comes in the form of the diploma and the medal and the testimonial, etc. But it is done with a kind of irony in which one realizes that there is no big other. The big other doesn't exist. But if you want some, uh, some symbolic form that is the proof that you have... Uh, completed your tests and you have come out with, uh, with the power to, uh, to, to liberate yourself, then so be it. And the wizard says here, he is authorized by e pluribus unum. Very important point, one out of many. In other words, non-duality is his authorization. He's in non-duality. And because he's in non-duality, he's authorized to recognize them for how far they come. He has an understanding of their relationship to non-duality. And the fact that this, uh, this complex, this being who, who comes as four beings in one, 
is actually already the totality. Toto is there, and, uh, and, and there is completion. So what the, the lesson that the wizard is giving is that all of reality is staged. It is a play. It is a play for your benefit. And the only way that you get benefit from the play is realizing you have no enemies. But you also have no one that you should feel either inferior to or superior to. The ego makes the mistake of judging some people negatively. The ego is disappointed in some people. This is a very bad mistake because in the play, it is necessary for you to be disappointed in order for you to recognize that your primary disappointment is always in yourself for the failure of your own ego. And you would much rather project your disappointment on someone else so as not to have to face that. But it's only in the recognition that imperfection is the way that the world appears. And you cannot be perfect, not even Toto. You cannot be perfect except by the transcendence of the imperfect ego and the realization that you are the non-dual totality that's in its wholeness, in its love, in its integral nature of mutual enhancement, mutual liberation of the whole through love, perfection does appear. But it is never the property of any individual being. So the self appears as the radiant sameness that is the blissful perfection of the truth. This, uh, everyone now is satisfied. The three animus figures have signifiers that satisfy them, but Dorothy requires a different treatment. She must go it alone. So the, uh, the, the wizard says he will take her back to earth, but Toto makes sure she gets out of the, air, the, the hot air balloon uh, and he goes alone. The balloon, by the way, says state fair. His state is fair, and his mantra is om aha. And so he goes back to the om, but she cannot go back with him. She has to have her own aha, and that aha is the realization that she has the power through the ruby slippers that she is wearing that, that she has earned, that does belong to her, that prove that she is a witch, she has the power to return uh, to the world that she left behind, but to realize it as the integration of real one, two, and three, as a single non-dual whole. That's why she says, and I think the most important a sentence that she speaks in the film, which makes no sense at all from a logical perspective within duality. If I ever go looking for my heart's desire again, I won't look any further than my own backyard. Because if it isn't there, I never really lost it to begin with. Okay? So what she's saying is she's going back to her backyard, but not because her backyard has the goodness and the, the infinite beauty and perfection she's looking for. No, it's because it isn't there. And it isn't there because it's in her. She has never lost it. But not she as an ego, she as the realization of the one self that is the perfection that once real one is seen with that perfection, that is home. Okay? Oz is not home. Oz is, is a transit realm, a bardo state you have to pass through. But she returns home to the absolute that can appear only as the relative. And she's back with her relatives. But she's back with them realizing that all the people in real one are the same ones as in real two, and Toto representing real three, 
is the unifying factor that has enabled the successful completion of the quest. And she realizes that the signifier I has no signified except the absolute, the whole, the total. Mm -hmm. And so she has realized the mind that is no mind and the truth that is uh, presented as fiction. And she is the avatar of that eternal home from which we have all come. Namaste. I hope that was useful. I only got one boo, so I'll assume that, <laughs> that I passed maybe this test. But how, how many feel that this was useful in seeing the film? Okay, so I didn't ruin it for you, did I? I hope not. Uh, but I think there's a tremendous amount of wisdom, as you see, in the film, and that there's a good reason why it is returned to over and over again. Does anyone want to say anything before I uh, flee the scene? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you want to say anything, Dorothy? I have a question about the apple tree. Uh huh. Yeah, it's the reverse of it, though, because because this tree is actually nourishing them to return to non-duality. Rather than having to see duality. Yeah. Um, I found it very interesting how you um, explain that, though, needing the heart to, or the tin man needing the heart to be able to see the appear apparent insult for what it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you for the whole thing. Right. That's, that's incredible. Okay, thank you. Yes? You didn't talk about the lion. Well, I did a little bit. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, what he represents, the courage. And the... Well, I think he represents, uh, at one level, the lack of courage that compensates by bullying, right? But that has within it a, a desire uh, not to... Uh, create fear but love and so it's this torn understanding of do you have to defend your territory and look angry and mean in order to defend yourself in life or can you uh, come out of the closet as as one who is a being of love and acceptance and forgiveness and mercy and uh, who doesn't uh, need to play the game of power struggles and so it is in that realization of fearless courage to face everything, but, but non-violently, uh, that, that is the, let's say, the apotheosis of courage that enables him to finally gain his triple cross, right? Which means that, that uh, godhood in real one, two, and three. Like you mentioned, the goddess, and like that, that it explains the true meaning of the goddess. Mm -hmm. Is this like what you just explained? Mm -hmm. sense, or is it at another level? Well, remember, Glinda, the only time Glinda doesn't come to protect them is when she's with the witch. Dorothy cannot depend on, on the, the good witch uh, to help her uh, when she's dealing with the negative witch. She has to do this on her own, in the same way that the wizard isn't going to help her get back to Kansas. She, she has to do all of this. Uh, so uh, the, the goddess is the inner divine feminine that is now married to the, the divine masculine. She is now whole. She has gone beyond femininity because these three animus figures that are complexes within herself have now been integrated. And so she has uh, both the masculine and feminine powers and capacities, and she has reached the state of detachment where she is fearless uh, of death and of loss and of loneliness, etc. So the, she now has the luxury of love because there is no longer fear or desire. And so that, that I would say, is the meaning of the goddess. When, when that, uh, the feminine psychology of love over the power of the male ego, or even the divine masculine that, that is based on a much more uh, 
uh, let's say, a theoretical level of symbolic truth. The, it, it has to be uh, fleshed out with divine love that is capable of dreaming a new world. And she has proven her capacity uh, in dreaming. And you remember, dreaming is the essence of the work of Don Juan in, in that whole series of, uh, of the Don Juan books uh, of the Mexican shaman. So, so we have uh, her becoming the ultimate shamanic master. And that's really what the, the goddess is now representing. Okay. Yeah. To add a couple of questions. I know also to get home she had to tap her heels three times. Mm -hmm. Is that having to do with real one, two? Yeah, three? yeah, I would say that. That trinity shows up a lot. And then do you know why, and why an emerald? She ends up in Emerald City, or what's the city? Well, again, Emerald City is Ireland. Ireland is Arya land. This goes back to the whole Aryan, the noble race. She has become noble, spiritually royal, and so she is now able to bring that spiritual royalty back into the ordinary world and redream the world uh, in a new way. If I had directed the film, I would have had it turn into Technicolor in Kansas when she's back and wakes up from uh, the, the trance to show that the three worlds are now one. Yeah. So they didn't do that, but that would be how I would have interpreted it and ended it. Mm -hmm. One of, I mean, even more famous, perhaps I'm mistaken, but at least for myself, uh, than the movie in itself, is the song, the Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Mm -hmm. Uh, they've even done a, a recent mm -hmm. one that they're mm -hmm. singing in metros and um, in a kind of a Hawaiian style with an ukulele mm -hmm. and so on. And uh, I think it's it's fascinating to see how this song has touched so many generations mm -hmm. of people. Sure. How, how would you uh, explain that? Is it because it depicts this yearning that we all have in our hearts to find this Yes. This, uh, paradise, uh, this uh, Satyuga, uh, this... Uh, I, would say, I would say it depicts the purity of heart that has the courage to dare to yearn for heaven on earth and, and the, the power to make it a reality. And so uh, this, this song is her assertion of the truth of, of God consciousness that will conquer Maya. And, uh, and her assertion of that then brings about the realization of that truth. So yes, I think it's the ultimate inspiring song mm -hmm. that says, uh, stay in the purity of divine love. Don't believe you have to become a nasty capitalist to make it in the world. Mm -hmm. Don't believe you have to sell out your values. Don't believe you, you have to function as an ego. Don't believe you have to live in duality with judgments about others and about yourself. Uh, go for it. You are perfect. The world is perfect. You just need to open your third eye and see it, and, and you will be over the rainbow, and, and the world will have no more glitches, no more troubles. Everything will, will be beautiful. And so it is, I think, that ultimate uh, affirmation that we are not stuck with a Kali Yuga. We have dreamed it, and it is easy to get out of it, but we have to have the courage to redream the world to do that. And here's the real point that I think is, is the key. Saving your own soul is saving the world. It's not that, oh, I have to choose one or the other, and oh, I'm not interested in saving the world, I just want to save myself. No, saving yourself is perceiving all in God consciousness perceiving everyone as a manifestation of the one self. You are saving the world through your perception of others as already liberated. That itself is liberating them because you are dreaming everyone in the highest possible way. And therefore, you will be dreamed back in the highest possible way. That's all that Sat Yuga really is. So why not start seeing that now because it is the truth. Don't see the ego mask. See the real of beauty, infinite beauty and wisdom behind it in the ugliest ego and the world will become a paradise. Okay?
Yes. So the going back to the song over the rainbow, uh, there's also seems to be this paradoxical understanding that you have to go into the unknown because you don't know what's over the mm -hmm. rainbow. Mm -hmm. Yet there is a uh, what you're saying is that there is a redreaming that's happening mm -hmm. even though mm -hmm. you're in the unknown. That's right. So the unknown is what allows the redreaming sure. to happen. Yeah, sure. And you you know, life would be no fun if you knew in advance what was going to happen. So of course you have to not know. That's the thrill. That's the test. But if you have faith that you are actually the one dreaming this and there is love for yourself, the world will turn out to be a benevolent dream. No matter how horrific it might look at, at the superficial level, you're actually always being protected and taken care of. Even if it looks like horrible things have happened to you. That's not the case. In every moment, the best possible thing is going to happen to you if you understand its real significance. Even if it means you've gone psychotic, even if it means you've been injured or you've, you've, something, some really bad karma seemingly has happened, it's actually all good fortune if you see it accurately and take advantage of what this new situation offers uh, by seeing it in the deepest possible dimension. Okay. That's our, our uh, uh, test and, and our, our, our challenge. Yes? I think you are better than any movie. <laughs> <laughs> then I'm going to move along and, uh, and let you see the picture. Thank you all. Namaste. Namaste.